Okay, I guess uh, we should start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Abhishek has been introducing us all summer. So now uh, join me in welcoming Abhishek as he talks about average reward and learning and planning algorithms in the average reward setting. Uh, take it away, Abhishek. Thanks, Kuro. You had to say that, didn't you? Uh, but anyway, okay, so I hope you read these announcements here. And so, okay, let's begin. So yeah, today I'm going to tell you about learning and planning in average reward MDPs. And this is joint work with uh, Yivan and etc. Okay, so, so I'll first go through some main contributions that we made in this particular project. Then I'll walk you through the background, the problem setting, situate this work in the related work, then tell you about some algorithms and experiments, and then conclude with some directions for future work. Okay, so the main contributions are as follows. The first one is that uh, we propose the first general proven convergent of policy model free control algorithm without reference states. So there's a lot of qualifiers here, and uh, we will get to know about each of them as we go forward. Uh, the second contribution is the first convergent of policy model free prediction algorithm. Less qualifiers. And finally, we have a general technique to estimate the actual centered value function rather than the value function plus an offset. So, so this is just setting the stage and all of this will become more clearer as we go along. All right, so, uh, so let's start with some background. What is the problem setting? So obviously we are looking at continuing problems. This means that there are no episodes. It's just one long uh, interaction with the world and there are no artificial resets to any states. And we are working with the tabular representation at the moment and then at the end we'll talk about how we can generalize this to usual function approximation. And we are also looking at unichain MDPs. So what are unichain MDPs? Uh, these are MDPs that uh, for every stationary policy there is a set of recurrent state and a possibly empty set of transient states. So what are uh, recurrent and uh, transient states? So a set of recurrent states is one in which if you pick any two states, the agent can go from one state to the other state with probability one. And it can't do so with the transient state. So for a quick example, in this very small MDP, you can see that if the agent starts from here, it will eventually reach this loop. So this loop consists of a set of recurrent states because you can go from every state to every other state with probability one, but you can never go back to this state, right? So you will only visit this for a finite number of times, and that's why by definition it's called a transient state. Okay, so under, under this, the reward rate is defined as the expected one step, state with one step reward when following policy pi, averaged over some long duration. And uh, so for this formulation, the corresponding value function is defined as the expected sum of rewards uh, in excess of this average reward uh, when you're following, following policy pi starting from state s. And again, this is averaged over some duration. And corresponding to this differential value function, this is the Bellman equation for state values. Uh, this is very similar to what you know from the discounter setting. The only difference being that the term here is r minus r bar plus v of s prime instead of r plus gamma v of s prime, right? And the corresponding Bellman optimality equation is this. Again, something you might be familiar with. Okay, so one thing to note uh, that is special in this particular setting is that if you look at this uh, Bellman equation, if you consider one solution to these Bellman equations, so let's say V is that solution, and then V of S the, is the value of every state. So is let's see if that V plus a constant C is also a solution to the Bellman equations, right? So let's say we have a solution V, and I add a constant C, a real number, to all those values. So what happens? So on the left-hand side, we would have a V of S plus C, on the right hand side, we would have a sum over all V of S prime plus C. And because this constant C does not depend on any of these uh, quantities, it just comes out. And so you have a plus C on both sides. Everything is still satisfied. So all of this is to say that uh, for any solution V to the 
Bellman equations corresponding to the differential value functions, you will have infinitely many solutions of the form V plus C E, where E is the vector of all bars. So basically there's a unique solution for R bar, but there are multiple solutions for V and Q. So this will come up later and just keep this in mind. All right, so let me now talk about what already exists. So in terms of average reward learning algorithms, so along the axis of on policy, off policy learning, prediction and control, uh, there are there have been many algorithms proposed. So let's look at on policy prediction. Sitsiklis and Van Roy proposed a convergent TD lambda algorithm with linear function approximation back in 1999, then followed by some actor-critic algorithms by Konda and Sitsiklis, then Bhatnagar et al. for on policy control but this is in the tablet setting. And in off policy control, the first average reward algorithm was proposed by Schwartz in this pioneering paper in 1993 called R Learning, which was followed by a couple of variants from Singh. But both of these algorithms, they are grayed out because they don't have any convergence proofs. Right? Um, and more recently, there was RBIQ Learning proposed by Abunadi, Bertsekes, and Borker, which was kind of consider the Q learning of the average reward setting up to this point. And uh, then there's another variant of that by Gosavi in 2004. So both of these are proven convergent in the tabular setting. So this particular work introduces differential Q learning for off policy control and differential TD learning for off policy prediction. Um, and this is the first off policy prediction learning algorithm that we are aware of. and uh, Obviously, this can also be applied in the on policy setting when the important sampling ratios are all one, right? And uh, so, apart from these algorithms, which maximize, uh, which look at asymptotic performance, there are also many algorithms that minimize regret, which is like how bad you're doing as compared to the op how you could have done optimally uh, up to some time t. And so, algorithms like UCRL2, Polytech, OptQL, EQL. Uh, these exist, but uh, yeah, there are a couple of things uh, here that they're typically not off policy because you need to specify and control this uh, behavior policy because uh, that is how you can exactly comment on the regret bounds that you're uh, proposing. And additionally, in some of these algorithms, the value estimates can be unbounded, uh, which could be a problem when you are uh, considering, let's say, curating predictive knowledge, for example, in the form of GBF. So you want the value estimates to be bounded and meaningful. Um, so yeah, so so what happens now? So recall that the Bellman equation for state values look like this. Now note that this term, the average reward term, it is uh, it does not depend on the actions you take or the next state that you see. It's just a constant, right? So you can switch it around, take it to the other side, bring this here, and these two equations are exactly equivalent. So now we have an expectation form of this average reward. So if I had, if, if I wanted to convert this into an online update, I could take this quantity as the target and just update my estimate for the average reward like this. So this is the target, previous estimate, just use a usual exponential averaging, right? So this could be one way you could convert this into an online sample-based update. Uh, now, in case the limiting distribution exists, the analytical form of the average reward is like this. So there is a term which is like a on policy. So d pi s is the on policy distribution over states. And this is the expected one step reward. And r pi is the average reward in that case. So as you can see, again, this is another expectation form and you can convert this to uh, online sample based update by taking this reward R that you see at every step as your target. And yeah, your old estimate is you can error with respect to that. Again, you can do an exponential average. But note that the difference between these two expectation forms is that one relies on the state distribution, whereas the other does not, right? So, okay, so we'll look at this in more detail. Now note that this term, reward minus average reward plus value of next state minus value of previous state 
is the TD error in this formulation, right? So, so yeah, that's how we get the first control algorithm. This is the TD error. You update the action values based on and step towards this TD error, alpha delta T. And you update the average reward again using the same quantity delta T, this TD error. But now the step size is a different one. It is just scaled by some constant eta, which is some real number, right? So these two updates are of very similar form. And uh, that gives you the differential Q learning algorithm. And uh, so yeah, that is the, the convergence proof for that, which says that, okay, given all these conditions, this converges almost surely this estimate to R pi star, which is the average reward of the optimal policy, and QT will converge to a solution of the Bellman optimality equation. Note that there are many solutions to the Bellman optimality equation, so QT will converge to one of them. Okay, so we'll we'll get back to this later. So in algorithm form, it looks like this. Uh, step six, seven, eight is what you saw in the previous slide. Um, and the rest is just the usual uh, agent environment interaction loop. Now, remember RBA Q learning, uh, the algorithm that we spoke of. So the update for that is uh, instead of the TD error, there is this term. So basically, R minus R bar is replaced by R minus some F of Q. So basically, they don't uh, keep an estimate of the reward rate, but they analytically compute some function of the action values and show that this F of Q will converge to the true reward rate under uh, certain conditions that F has to follow. And uh, if, uh, so, okay, so what are some F of Qs? So a simple one could be just an average over all your action values. So F of Q could be an average of all your uh, state action pairs, the action values of that. Or in the degenerate case, it could be the value of a single reference state action pair. So F of Q could be some Q of S naught A naught, right? And uh, so now we'll look at how uh, this can prove to be a little problematic if you're relying on this F of Q to converge to the true reward rate estimate, right? So, okay, so here's a simple pathological example. So this is a two state MDP. Now state zero, you can take action A. You might stay in this state or go to this next state where you will remain by taking, okay, this is also an action A. If you take action B in state zero, you'll reach one uh, with deterministically and you'll stay there, right? So as you might notice, the state zero is transient under all policies, which means you can choose any policy, but you will only visit this a finite number of times and eventually you'll end up here, right? So if you are using an online algorithm to estimate the values uh, of this particular MDP, uh, you cannot get the value of this state, right? Because you'll only visit it like a finite number of times, right? So, so if I choose that to be my reference state action pair, so f of q is q of zero a, this transient state, then yeah, what do you expect will happen, right? So this f of q uh, cannot converge to the true reward rate. And so what will happen is it will stay f of q, which is your proxy for the reward, uh, reward rate estimate. It is going to stay zero where it was initialized, but this value of this other state, which relies on this to be correct. So the true reward rate in this case is two, right? Because you'll just keep getting two. And this value stays where it was initialized. So this just becomes unbounded. This just keeps increasing. In this case, it increases because this estimate is a underestimate of the true reward rate, but it could also go to minus infinity if it was an overestimate, right? Um, but yeah, in differential Q learning, your reward rate R bar will converge to the true reward rate, which is two. And F of Q of one A, the value of this state converges to its right value, even though these two states are transient and uh, you don't get the values of that curve, right? So, so the takeaway is that RBIQ learning diverges if the reference state is transient. Um, and transient states do not have an effect for the convergence of differential Q learning. That's takeaway number one. Uh, now, that was a very simplistic pathological example, but uh, let's look at a slightly bigger domain. So this is the access control queuing task in which there are all these jobs uh, with different priorities that come to this scheduler. And the scheduler will then allow 
these jobs to go on these servers if these servers are free, depending on how many servers are free, what is the priority. And the if the priority is high, you get a higher reward, right? So in the problem we consider, there are 10 servers, four priorities, and the probability of a server becoming free if it is occupied is 0 0.06 at every time step. Yeah, of course. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so given these particular, uh, so we try different parameter settings and choose all possible reference states for, so, okay. In this task, you can't really make a nice clean MDP for this, right? And so it's hard for you to say, okay, what could be a good reference state that is not transient, hopefully. And uh, so what could you do? Well, we just swept over all particular state action pairs as reference states. And we found that, okay, for the best setting of the reference state and the step size parameter, both algorithms do uh, almost equally well. But the interesting thing is what happens across the board, right? So now these are sensitivity curves. On the x-axis, you have step sizes, alpha. On the y-axis, you have the reward rate over the entire course of tra training, averaged over 30 runs, right? And so now you can see that if I pick a reference state 11, this is the kind of performance profile I see. Higher is better, more reward is good. Uh, but if I, let's say, picked reference state 43, I would have ended up like you know in this pretty bad state, right? And so basically, if I choose, if I end up with a good reference state, I'll do well, but otherwise you might do pretty bad. But on the other hand, with differential queue learning, you see that uh, this is pretty robust to your choice of your parameter eta. And uh, yeah, across the board, the performance is quite consistent, which is something we would want, as opposed to having to choose a particular reference state and uh, hopefully not end up in a lottery-like situation. Right, so RVAQ learning's performance depends significantly on the choice of reference state, whereas differential queue learning's performance varies only slightly over a wide range of parameter values. We have more experiments in the paper, which uh, people can look at. And yeah, so now this same story in prediction. So you can, again, use this TD error to update your value estimate as well as your reward rate. But this time now they're scaled with the important sampling ratio. Um, and so this is differential TD learning. It has a similar theorem, similar proof. It says that this converges almost surely. You are estimate to the reward rate of the target policy and your value estimates to a solution of the bill manipulations. And again, so again, this is the algorithm. Five, six, seven, eight is what you saw in the previous slide. And as a baseline, here we are looking at average cost TD learning, which was the uh, Tsitsiklis Van Roy thing from 1999. So remember the update which uses, which is inspired from the uh, state distribution form of the reward rate, like basically the analytical form. So this one uses that. And yeah, so it, an important sampling ratio here is not enough to, uh, to make this converge to the reward rate of the target policy, because uh, this update comes from uh, an anal analytical solution that depends on the state distribution as well. So you have to correct for that too, which it does not. And so this is restricted to the on policy setting. Um, and yeah, differential TD learning on the other hand, that update is independent of the state distribution. And so it converges to the target policies reward rate uh, without any such, uh, without requiring any state distributions. So again, a sanity check, simple MDP in state zero. If you go left, you get a plus one, and then you loop back here. If you go right, you get a plus two with it, some delay, some parameter settings. Now, this is prediction. So the usual evaluation metric is like this. Uh, you know, you take the norm of your solution that you converge to with respect to the true value function. But like I told you, in this uh, average reward setting, there are many possible solutions to the Bellman equation. So algorithm could have converged to any one of them. And so you would want to compare it against the solution that is closest to it. So what this does is you compare it to a V pi plus C E and then take an infimum over all Cs. So basically this, you are comparing your estimate to a solution that is closest to this particular solution. And again, this metric was proposed by Atsitsiklis and Van Roy. 
in their average cost three paper, and that is the one we use. And yeah, so some learning curves. The blue corresponds to differential TD learning, the on policy version. You can see that it's slightly faster in terms of getting the root mean squared value error, this version, Sitsiklis and Van Roy version, to close to zero. Uh, so it's slightly faster. And you can see that the off policy version of it works too, albeit a little slowly because you know mismatch between the off policy and waiver policy and the target policy. But again, the interesting stuff is happening here uh, in the sensitivity analysis that, uh, again, on x-axis is the step size alpha, y-axis is the average root mean squared value error over the entire course of training. So this is like area under the curve, a proxy for uh, sample efficiency. So as you can see, for uh, higher step sizes, larger step sizes, uh, average cost TD learning takes longer to converge, if at all it does. Whereas uh, this profile is relatively flat for differential TD learning, which means for a wide range of parameters here again, it converges faster. And uh, as for the off policy version of this, which is the first of its kind, again, the profile is like this. For a broad range of parameters, it does pretty well. For some extreme ones, uh, not so much. But yeah, uh, at least this new algorithm in this particular setting works as well. Sanity check, all good. Um, yeah, so now recall that the differential value function has many solutions of the form v pi plus c, right? So any value, any solution, you add a constant times one vector to it. Those are all solutions to the Bellman equations, right? Now there is a lemma which says that uh, the average of the value functions is zero. What does that mean? That uh, so okay, intuitively, what is it saying? So the differential value function in sort of the GVA form, what question is it asking? It is asking, starting from this state, how much more reward do I get than on average, right? And so from some states, it will you'll get more than average. From some states, you'll get less than average. But overall, an average of all this is zero, right? Some positive things, some negative things, or all zero. So that's intuitively why this is true. And this follows from definitions, right? Like this is not an additional constraint we're adding. This is just true from the definition of the differential value function. And uh, which means that while there are many solutions to the Bellman equations, there is only one centered differential value function. Uh, and all the algorithms that we discussed up to this point, including ours, converge to one particular solution which could be offset from this center differential value function. And so the natural question is, is there a way in which you can es directly estimate this centered differential value function? And so yeah, we, th we started thinking about it. And so, OK, again, if you look at a general solution, if you multiply this with, uh, take a dot product with d pi on both sides, what you end up with is this. So this is d pi v, d pi v pi 0. And if I c times c, because it's a probability distribution, you just end up with a constant. So basically, uh, the solution that you end up, it is offset from the center differential value function by this value of c, which is basically an average of your estimated value function. Now note that this is suspiciously similar to the definition of the reward rate, which is uh, like a dot product of the one step expected reward from every state. And so the form is very similar, right? So, so the intuition here is that, okay, if you, if you used all these methods to estimate the reward rate in this fashion by uh, averaging your rewards in a particular way, you can use, you can think of an MDP in which uh, instead of this reward, your value of that state is the reward. And now you want to estimate an average value instead of an average reward, right? And they're of the same form. So what happens is this was your system one. This is how you're estimating the reward rate and the corresponding differential value function. The system two is exactly of the same form. Now this R bar is replaced by a V bar, which estimates the your uh, centered of your, like your average of your values. And again, so there's a theorem which says that if those previous assumptions hold, your R bar would converge to the true reward rate, and this Vt minus 
Vt bar that you estimated times E will converge to the center differential value function. So long story short, this is one simple way to estimate your the center differential value function directly instead of estimating something with an offset. And again, so sanity check, uh, the evaluation metric is now the usual RMSV because now we can compare it to the center differential value function instead of any solution. And yeah, again, long story short, it works. So RMSV on the y-axis, center, center differential Q learning will converge to a RMSV of zero, whereas these other algorithms converge to some solution which have a constant offset. Sensitivity analysis, quite robust parameters, good. Anyway, so, right, so these were the three contributions I went through that. And so some additional points are that all the learning algorithms are fully online. And the planning algorithms, while I didn't really talk about them, instead of real world interactions, it's just interaction with a perfect model. Those are fully incremental. And we find out that empirically, the use of TD error generally results in faster learning in the domains tested. And reliance on a reference state generally results in slower learning and this divergence. And yeah, so obviously, we are now working on extending all of these tabular algorithms to pro and conversion uh, guarantees in the function approximation setting. So currently, we are working with linear function approximation for both learning and planning. But as you might expect, uh, it becomes messy because of the deadly triad. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, work that has to go into it. Hopefully, can take some inspiration from ETD, GTD, and all the new off policy stuff by, let's say, Lee Hongli's group and stuff. And yeah, the second natural extension is to SMDPs so that all of this can be used with temporal abstractions. Uh, yeah, because I believe that's how, like, you can't get to AGI by planning at the scale of uh, muscular interactions or something like that. And I also have some uh, preliminary. Uh, theoretical results, which uh, say that if the agent centers its features online, uh, it can stabilize this off policy learning by doing some nice things to the key matrix. But yeah, so this is all stuff that's going on. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot to do. And if you have, uh, if you are interested, you can talk to me, we or Rich, go through our paper, look at the code. And yeah, the floor is open to questions. I have a question. Yes, Martha. Surprise, surprise. Um, <clears throat> really nice algorithm. I like it. It's it's intuitively makes a lot of sense. It's cool you guys could prove stuff about it. So when you introduce why the R bar could be updated the way that it is using like the T error, um, I guess that relied on the value function that satisfied the Bellman equation. But your value function doesn't satisfy the Bellman equation. I mean, when, when you actually are running it. Yeah, yeah. so. Uh, so it's kind of like a GPS sort of a thing in which both things are happening together, but eventually they both do the right thing. They converge to the right thing. Nice. So it's not like a two time scale thing. You don't have to wait for one thing to work out completely before you can make an update to the other thing. Okay. Can you give any intuition why why it works out? Um, yeah. So how do I? Okay, so the thing to note is that, uh, right, so now if you look at these equations, they are of, uh, so these two are equivalent. And if you note these two variables, so value of state for all states and this R bar are uh, three variables of the same kind, right? So they are, they are just S plus one variables of the same kind. There is nothing really special about this R bar variable. And so, it's just s plus one variables doing that thing. There's nothing. Um, yeah. I see. Okay, so you just have an extended Bellman equation, kind of thing. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it's a very simple idea and intuition. And is this algorithm new, or is it the one in the book? So the one in the book. Uh, so that's differential SARSA, and uh, it uses the same idea of using the T year to do updates, and it was mostly inspired by. Uh, there being less variance in the updates once you have converged. Uh, but yeah, this is like the first formal analysis of the entire family of algorithms that comes from that idea of using 
the TD error. Nice. Okay. I have a question. Yes, Rich. So as you know, I've been pushing for um, uh, average reward algorithms and um, and saying we should all use them. And uh, but so can we now? I mean, are we uh, are we there yet? Well, yeah, I guess that depends on what you mean by you know being able to use it. Um, so yeah, okay. So let's say five months ago, before we had done any work on this, uh, we would have thought that you know if an algorithm is called RBA Q learning, it is the Q learning of the average reward literature, right? And if you wanted to use an algorithm, you would you know go for that. But as we uncovered over these few months, that you know there are problems with that, and Yes, now we think that the replacement, which is this differential Q learning, is that should that is the Q learning of this average reward setting, and it's uh, yeah, it's fast, reliable, works across a broad range of parameters, and yeah, if you wanted to try it out, this this is probably your go-to algorithm now. I mean, yeah, if you're doing, you know. Uh, if you're working with primitive actions. So we are working on the options version of things. And uh, yeah, obviously, all of this can be extended to the end step, lambda returns. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's all uh, work in progress. But it's like you need X amount of work to do it, and you can do it. Um, there's no fundamental new idea that you have to think through to do that. The open things are now just how to do extend all of this to the general function approximation setting for off policy and um, yeah, that's kind of the open question because we still don't know how to do off policy corrections uh, correctly, reliably, even in the discounted setting. So like that's that is where some new insights are required. But yeah, yeah. So if people have ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. So there is a question in, in the chat, Abhishek. Uh, I can yeah, read it. Double asks, uh, based on the update of the average reward and the Q function, isn't there a function in RBI? OK, so that's a great question. He's asking that, uh, uh, is there a point of similarity in, like, is there a particular instantiation of that F function in RBI Q learning, which uh, gives you something similar to our different Q learning? So, so yes, so there is this one point of uh, similarity, which is so if, if your f of q is an average over all state action pairs, and your eta parameter, this is one upon s a, which is like all state action pairs, then these two will make similar updates. It's not exactly the average, right? It's the state distribution under the policy, state and the action distribution under the policy, that weighted average. That will give it right, the... right. So, so, uh, so basically, when f, this f of q is that average and your eta is 1 by sa, then these two things uh, will make similar updates. But for uh, any other choice of eta, uh, th this will be different. These algorithms are different. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking if that is, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so again, you might ask that uh, if you have any other choice of eta uh, that works, then like, uh, what did you have to do different from you know, RBIQ learning? Um, does the same proof not apply or things like that? So, uh, so the thing is that this f has these particular conditions that it has to satisfy, and the average of the uh, action values in that manner that you suggested satisfies that. and But if you pick uh, any other eta other than 1 by SA, this function, the conditions on f will not be satisfied. And so this proof no longer applies. And so we have to do some other things to make this work. And uh, 
yeah, you uh, we have results which show that one by SA is not really a good choice. That that generally results in poor performance. But once you have this freedom over picking uh, values, different values of eta, that works out much better. Intuitively, you can think that you know one by SA can be very large if your you know straight action space is large, and so you might end up making very slow updates to your reward rate term. And uh, RVIQ learning will ask you to do that, uh, but with differential Q learning, you can do pick any eta, and it's fine. OK. Yeah, I was just assuming if eta is something different, then the value might just be shifted by a constant. OK. Yeah, yeah so it's shifted be... by a constant, but uh, it because of that constant, it does not satisfy the strict conditions on f that uh, RVIQ learning asks you to have. And so but if, it, if you yeah. can maintain a constant, then you just negate it, right? And uh, ignore, like, counter the small step size problem. Uh, what do you mean? Ah, OK, please, sir. Okay, yeah, we can uh, talk about that offline, if you want. Yep, yep, Martha. Can you remind me why there's an alpha, there's an eta, alpha, data, uh, delta in the R bar? Right, so delta is the TD error, alpha is the step size, and eta here is just a constant that scales the step size for this. So you could replace eta alpha by a beta, like a different step size. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, for let's say the practitioner, that is, we just make uh, scale it by some eta, which you can set to like 1.5, uh, which uh, instead of trying to choose values for it independently. So I guess the idea is to give you some intuition of are you going faster or slower and updating R than Q. Right. Uh, but yeah, it could be. So it, it's not uh, necessary to have a scale version of this thing. You could just replace it by any beta. The proofs would still work out. But it just makes the math much easier to present, because now you can make present these two updates together in one form, rather than having uh, to analyze two different updates all the time. Mm. Could eta be dependent upon uh, some kind of a state visitation frequency? Like, uh, let's say, so you're updating QSA for a given state and action every uh, 100 steps. Uh, and so eta could be like, let's say, a factor of something to do 100. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Like, yeah, I mean, it could be any. Like you, yeah. Dash, but you'll have a bigger learning rate for QSA because you're seeing less number of samples for each state action pair, but you're seeing more samples for your R, uh, reward, average reward. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you could uh, set it in ways uh, which are depending dependent on like how much time you see every state action pair. Um, and yeah, as far as I can tell, that shouldn't affect the convergence. Uh, too much, but uh, yeah, I guess Brendan is asking the same thing. Is eta entirely arbitrary? Uh, yes, I mean, eta is a real number. It is just scaling the step size this thing, but uh, so yeah, it has to satisfy the standard. So these two, like when I talk about, let's say the uh, algorithm, the, yeah, so if you look at this, when I say the step size are decreased appropriately, this is, you know, the standard robbins Munro step size assumption that uh, uh, the sum goes to infinity, square goes to 0. Um, and yeah, so if you have an alpha which follows this, any eta times alpha would also follow this unless that eta is you know, 0 or infinity. So uh, yeah, that eta is like as long as it satisfies these conditions, it's fine. It's not completely arbitrary, but like there's no Real special conditions that it has to follow. I have one more comment. Maybe I know this is a little over time. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that I haven't thought at all about average reward uh, uh, problems. I really should think more about them. But now, when you say this thing about the Bellman equation, where you know you just have this additional variable, 
I guess here's kind of an interesting thing is that you're doing this asynchronous updating and one variable is getting updated way more than the other variables, which is R bar. Yeah. And uh, so in, in the tabular case, I mean, it doesn't matter that you would do that. But in the function approximation case, I wonder if that's going to start mattering and you might want to be more careful about not always updating. Like maybe we don't want to update R bar every time if we're thinking of it like a Bellman style iterative update. Right. Or so, changing the distribution of the variables. Or or is it actually fine? Is the way that we look at the Bellman operators fine to update R bar much more than the other variables? Um, yeah, so so uh, I gave you the intuition that there are variables of the similar kind, and that's why I guess uh, this question arises that you know one of them seem to be getting a lot more attention than the other ones, right? And so when the state distribution actually matters, uh, this might play a role. But uh, so while this R bar term is uh, very similar to these other three variables, uh, it is still you know somewhat special in the sense that it is trying to estimate something which is uh, different than the action values. It is trying to estimate the reward rate. And um, I guess more samples doesn't really negatively harm that. It would probably just uh, get more accurate quickly, I suppose. But um, yeah, I think uh, we should look at it carefully as to, OK, if we have more budget, do you want to um, try to assign some of those updates to some other action values or something? And OK, there's a couple more questions in the chat. So double asks, do value of transient states matter, or do we actually assign any value to transient states? OK, so that's another good question. So if um, so transient states, by definition, is something you only do for a finite amount of time, and then you never visit those states again, right? So you might ask, um, what would you do in real life in such situations, right? If if I ask you to, I don't know, screw a bulb while hanging upside down or something like that, like you might do it once, but there's no maybe no real utility in you know being in, trying to be an expert in that, right? So it's OK if you don't. It's completely OK if you don't estimate the value of those states accurately, because you know you just visit them for a finite number of time. It's OK. You will never see them again. Uh, so while you're visiting them, you want to try to do something OK with it. But like once you're out of that, if you never visit it again, you have limited function approximation resources. You want to put it on states that you actually see. right? And so, so yeah, to answer your question, in the online setting, we do not care about the value of transient states at all. Um, and then Brendan asks, might there be any benefit from having even more auxiliary estimates? Um, I guess there is some uh, indication from like applying RL on these big problems with large function approximators that having some sort of auxiliary task helps with the main task but you know that's a that's a underdeveloped research area we don't really know which auxiliary tasks help or why they help or how you should think of them and design them so for them to help um, but yeah here in this particular case it's not like it just came up naturally it's not something we uh, we came up with a particular auxiliary task. It, it just, yeah, it just happens to be that way. OK, and Martha asks, uh, the reason updating R bar could hurt is that divergence occurs due to skewing the distribution of states. If we think of R bar as the value of state n plus 1, we will give it higher weight. Similarly, say that in TD, updating a state more shouldn't hurt, uh, but it does. So yeah, that's a, uh, that's a fair point, but uh, I know. I, uh, yeah, this is something I guess we need to analyze both theoretically and empirically. But um, at least my intuition is that um, trying to get the reward rate right um, shouldn't have negative effects. But I guess you're right. I'm not sure. I didn't actually mean to bring it up again. I'm sorry. I was just typing there what I was thinking. I didn't didn't mean to ask a question. But actually, maybe because our bar has its own function approximator, essentially, like it has its own feature. It gets to be its own estimator. Maybe it doesn't contribute to this trade off between things. So it doesn't have the same intuition. So maybe you're right. Maybe we can always update our bar. 
yeah but but Thanks. you're right uh, this is something we could look at more carefully uh, both theoretically and practically cool so if there are no more questions let's thank abhishek for uh, one last thing one last thing uh, can you go to the future work once yes we'll go to the future work in the future <laughs> for sure and the future is here is here yeah. that's on to the last point uh -huh. uh, extension yeah 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 so the uh, centering the features actually like ppu actually does that all the policy gradient algorithms actually do online centering of features right yeah. most of the algorithms do that so are you trying to prove that uh, theoretically or empirically yeah so like i said i have some preliminary theoretical results which say which kind of look at uh, how this could potentially help in this off policy setting uh, that how uh, if you if you you have a re reliable estimates of your feature centers and that you subtract them uh, it affects your key matrix and the mm. eigen values in some interesting ways that could uh, stabilize this so yeah this is more of a theoretical uh, this thing maybe people have been using it practically for a while now but uh, yeah. as far as i know I, i haven't been able to find something which tells me why it would help but uh, yeah there are some things that i'm using but uh, yeah this is something i, I i'm looking into okay thanks now uh, can i show the slide which shows how differential q function is defined okay ah uh, right the Sorry for the really basic question. That just yeah. it's over, over my head, so I wanted to try to follow the beginning. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, so this is the differential value function um, expected. So sum of rewards in excess of the average reward, uh, averaged over a long time. So there is a slight mathematical subtlety here, which is that this is a Cesaro sum, not a usual average. So this is just because it takes care of uh cases in which you have you know periodicity like so people generally make this ergodic assumption where things have to be a periodic so so we don't make that and just use this uh cesaro sums to make sure that this limit exists even if things are periodic but yeah intuitively this is just uh an average of the rewards that you see uh in excess of the average reward starting from a state s following policy pi so that's v pi of s so if you had to say this equation in english like like i was 5 years old what was that? <laughs> sorry how would, you, how would you explain that yeah so it's like um starting from a state how much more reward do you get than on average when following some policy and when you say how much more reward you mean total reward yes like the sum yes so are, are we back to the the idea of cumulative rewards over time yeah so this is cumulative rewards over time just that this is not unbounded so if you simply take a sum of rewards over infinity that obviously will be unbounded but this is the sum of uh differential rewards so you are subtracting this average out from it so this thing is always bounded given that you know each rt is not infinite or something so r so, pi is one scalar value for your pol for your whole policy yes so under the unichain assumption this is one scalar value for your entire policy and it does not depend on individual states mm. cool thank you thanks for the awesome talk thank you no problem Okay, I guess now maybe no one has any more questions, and we can uh, thank Abhishek. Thanks, Abhishek, for the great talk, and uh, 
we'll see you tomorrow for the next talk yep thank you all for your time and yeah see you guys tomorrow